Hello, everyone, and welcome to today's live broadcast from Genomics to Precision Medicine, Uncovering and Manipulating the Genetic Circuits Underlying Common Disease. My name is Jean Pham from LabRoots, and I'll be your moderator for today's event. Today's educational web seminar is presented by LabRoots, the leading scientific social networking website and provider of virtual events and webinars advancing scientific collaboration and learning. We'd also like to acknowledge the CNE and group for help with programming and promotion of the event. Before we start, there are a few instructions. We want to hear from you during this interactive broadcast, so please ask questions or leave us a comment. Answers are welcome too. You can do this by hitting the green Q&A button at the lower left of the presentation window and typing in your comments and questions. We'll, get, we'll try to get to as many as we can, and we'll follow up with you if we don't have time for everything today. Do you want a better look? You can enlarge the slide window by clicking on the screen icon at the lower right-hand corner of the slide window. If you can't hear or see this presentation properly, let us know by clicking on the support button at the top right or use the Q&A button. We'll make sure to resolve any issues. This is an educational webinar and thus offers free continuing education credit. After the webinar is over, please click on the CE button located at the bottom left-hand corner of your webpage and follow the process to obtain your credits. Now let's get right to today's presenter. We're proud to welcome Dr. Manolis Kellis. Dr. Kellis is a professor of computa computer science at MIT, where he directs the MIT Computational Biology Group. He has helped direct several large-scale genomics projects, including the NIH Roadmap Epigenomics Project, the Comparative Analysis of 29 Mammals, the Encyclopedia of DNA Elements, or the ENCODE Project, and the Genotype Tissue Expression Project. The planner for this event has stated no relevant financial relationships. However, Dr. Kevin Davies did disclose that he is a scientific advisory board member for the Pathway Genomics and is on the Speaker Bureau for Harry Walker, Inc., and that neither constitutes a conflict of interest. Please note that Dr. Kellis has indicated that he has no relevant financial relationships relative to this topic. I will now turn it over to Dr. Kellis for his presentation. Not yet. Okay, great. When I see myself, I'll start. Hello. Thank you, everyone, for coming. Today, I'll talk to you about uh, how we can actually translate genomic knowledge into uh, personalized medicine, and specifically, how we can exploit regulatory genomics and epigenomics, focusing on non-coding disease regions. So what you can see is that um, precision medicine has really taken off in the um, private view of um, across both industry, academia, and the government. And uh, the challenge is to actually deliver on the promise of genetics. So what is that promise of genetics? The promise of genetics is by, that by carrying out a genome-wide association study, by basically looking at every SNP position on the x-axis across the 23 chromosomes and then measuring for every one of those genetic regions what is its association with a particular trait of interest that we can uncover genetic regions that have a very strong, very statistically significant association using this very simple chi-square statistical test. And out of those regions we should be able to discover new potential target genes, potentially new therapeutics, understanding mechanisms, and eventually enabling personalized medicine. But this has been a very big challenge. And there's been a lot of anticipated challenges in understanding the mechanism underlying human disease. But perhaps the most surprising challenge, at least in the public's view, is that the vast majority of these disease regions do not affect genes directly. They do not affect the proteins directly. What they do instead is that they alter the regulation of these genes. So when you open up the hood under these regions and you expand them out, what do you see? You see that there are sometimes hundreds of genetic variants, but none of them is in fact altering a protein. What they do instead is that they sit either in uh, intergenic or intronic regions in the non-coding genome, and the mechanism through which they act is actually very difficult to elucidate, specifically for non-coding regions. Why is that? 
Well, the first reason is that there's a very large number of genetic variants, all of which are co-inherited. You can see here the relationship, uh, the relationship structure of many of these variants, which are in fact simply indistinguishable from each other in terms of their association with disease. And that makes it very difficult to find out which of these genetic variants is actually driving the disease, which of these genetic variants is actually causal. And it also makes it very difficult to identify what cell type these genetic variants act in. Because, frankly, they don't affect the genes, and therefore we can't simply utilize gene expression to figure out where they act. And, of course, even the target gene through which they act is actually not known. So that makes it very difficult to identify the mechanism through which genetic variants are acting. And NIH foresaw this and launched a large number of initiatives for actually dissecting the function of the non-coding genome. So the remedy that was proposed was to systematically annotate the non-coding genome. And projects such as the ENCODE project, the Encyclopedia of DNA Elements, the Epigenomics Roadmap Project from the NIH Common Fund or the Blueprint Project from uh, the European Union have actually sought to systematically annotate this non-coding genome and to do so across a very large number of different cell types, both in adults as well as in um, earlier stages of uh, life and even development. So the goal is to now start interpreting this information to link enhancers and their regulators to the target genes that they control and to develop new methods for utilizing that information. And the deliverables are sixfold. So number one, we want to figure out what are the cell types through which these genetic variants manifest themselves? Where do they act? Number two, what are the genes that they uh, control and what are the genes whose expression is altered between risk and non-risk individuals? Number three, what are the specific nucleotide mutations that are causal? Number four, what are the upstream regulators whose binding is disrupted? Number five, what are the relevant pathways through which these disease variants act? And number six, what are the intermediate cellular and organismal phenotypes on the way to uh, the disease? And that's what I'm going to try to address today. So first, we're going to talk about number one, how do we actually characterize the epigenomic landscape? Number two, how do we use that to identify disease-relevant tissues and regulators? Number three, how do we combine genetic variation and epigenetic variation in the context of disease? And number four, how do we uncover the mechanisms underlying disease, the circuitry underlying disease, and how do we actually manipulate these mechanisms? So let's dive right in. So how do we actually characterize the epigenomic landscape. So the first thing we're going to do is map non-coding elements, uncover cellular circuitry, and then link genetic variants or single nucleotide polymorphisms to the enhancers they lie within, the target genes that control, the regulators that control them, and the cell types in which they act. This is very much uh, following the path that was laid out by this uh, Roadmap Epigenomics uh, Consortium paper. So this was published uh, in Nature back in February, uh, about a year ago. And this paper basically presented the first reference map of a very large number of human primary tissues and cells. And this was a collaboration through many different labs across uh, the United States and the world, and uh, a, a wonderful uh, team of individuals working closely together over many, many years. So what did we do in this project? We basically said, let's now characterize the epigenome of a large number of adult and fetal tissues, as well as embryonic stem cells, iPS cells, and uh, iPS-derived cells. And for each of those, we map three types of modifications. First, we map the accessibility of the DNA itself. In other words, can a regulator actually bind a particular piece of DNA? Number two, we looked at DNA methylation. So CPG dinucleotides can actually undergo epigenetic modifications, which can alter the function of a particular genomic region by modifying the C in a CPG dinucleotide in both strands um, directly. 
And then the third type of modification is actually histone modifications. And these are modifications that happen at the tails of these histone proteins that DNA is wrapped around. So there's about 157, uh, 147 nucleotides, plus about a 50 nucleotide linker. So you can think of them as 200 base pair chunks along the genome that can be modified in, 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 a, in a very large number of ways. So we mapped five modifications systematically across the entire genome and a subset of additional modifications in more than 90 different um, cell types and many, many more modifications in a small number of cell types, as well as DNA accessibility, DNA methylation, and what you can think of as a little bit of the output of epigenetic information, which is the RNA expression levels of the corresponding genes. So what do we get with that information? Well, here's the view for one of the richest cell types. So this is IMR90 fibro lung fibroblasts. And what you can see is that the different modifications are very highly correlated with each other. So you can see here that along with RNA expression, there's a large number of modifications that actually mark transcribed regions, regions that are made into RNA. Then there's a whole set of modifications that mark promoter regions. So these are at the beginnings of genes and they sort of mark a little bit of where the gene starts. This is the stop sign right before uh, you know, the gene takes off. That's where you know, polymerase makes its final decision. And then you see these uh, marks that are pr predominantly found in these distal regulatory elements known as enhancer regions. So we were able to summarize all of that information with these highly correlated marks into a small number of distinct chromatin states. And we're going to be coloring those in different uh, colors that correspond to the underlying functions of these regions. And in this talk, I'll focus a lot on these enhancer regions, but we annotate the entirety of the uh, genome in enhancers that cover approximately 1% of the genome in each cell type, promoters that cover another 1%, transcribed regions that cover approximately 10 to 15 percent, and then repressed regions that cover another uh, few percentages, as well as these unannotated white regions that you see here that simply don't show any of these uh, modification marks. So we basically can summarize all of that information in each of the cell types, going from dozens of tracks in some of the cell types into a single track that basically tells you, using this very simple nomenclature, what is the underlying function of that piece of chromatin. So now, because we can actually summarize that very rich information in a single track, we can actually look at that same track in a very large number of cell types. So we've done exactly that, looking at more than 100 different human cell types, and this is what you see here. So across 127 cells and tissues, from uh, each of these uh, samples, we're able to now map these chromatin states and see at a glance how this particular gene, which I showed you as being repressed in this previous slide, is in fact repressed in most of the cell types, except for a handful of cell types where it seems to escape expression, uh, escape repression. And then you can see the promoter turning on here, a large number of enhancer elements turning on here, and then transcription going in this particular case from the right to the left of the slide. You see other genes that are uh, turning on in a subset of cell types, and you can also see uh, other genes that are constitutively on. The other thing you'll notice is that the promoters of these genes seem to be on even when the genes are not being actively transcribed. So that actually suggests that these regions are actually open pretty constitutively across different cell types. But in other regions, you see these enhancers that are turning on and off very dynamically and different sets of enhancers turning on in different cell types. So we can actually utilize this information to start learning something about the regulation of these cells. How? By basically taking all enhancer elements across the genome, lining them up side by side across 2.3 million of these elements, and then asking how do they relate to each other? So we basically did exactly that. So we looked at 2.3 million open chromatin regions that show these enhancer histone modification marks. And then we looked at the vector of activity across the 127 cell types, and we clustered them together 
into blocks of coordinated activity. And now what's really exciting is that if you look at the genes underlying these blocks, they actually play roles that make a lot of sense based on the tissues in which they are active. So the enhancers that are active in, in T cells and B cells play immune roles. The enhancers that are active in embryonic stem cells play developmental roles. The enhancers active in the brain play learning and memory roles, and so on and so forth. We can also utilize that information to start looking for sequence patterns or regulatory motifs that are found within these regions and correspond to the regulators that likely control these elements. And you can also utilize the activity patterns of these regions across different cell types in order to link together enhancers to the genes that they control through the coordinated activity of the modules of genes that we just discovered here and the modules of gene expression, which can be learned exactly the same way. So what that results in is a systematic uh, map that now allows us to go in any region of association and start mapping what are all of the genetic elements that are altered in these regions, and these are individual single nucleotide polymorphisms. What are the enhancers in which they fall? What cell types are these enhancers active in? What are the genes that each of these enhancers is likely controlling? And who are the regulators that control each of these elements? So we can go basically from an unannotated non-coding region that contains no protein alterations into a very complex circuit that basically tells you who are the likely target genes who are the likely driver SNPs, what are the enhancers that are altered, what are the cell types in which they function, and who are the regulators upstream of that. So um, I see a couple of questions, but I guess I'll take them at the end. I believe that some of them are already answered. Um, so the, uh, so we, we have actually taken all of that information and we've put it into a database. We call this database Haploreg for haplotype regulation. So if you just Google haploreg, you'll be able to find it, or you can simply type confbio.mit.edu slash haploreg. And this, this was originally published in 2011, and it was updated just a couple of months ago in uh, the database issue of the um, uh, NAR. So for every genetic variant, this tool allows you to look at all of the other genetic variants that are co-inherited with it, and for each of them, allow you to mine all of this extremely rich information about enhancer activity, promoter activity, DNA accessibility, which proteins are actually bound, what are the motifs that are disrupted or altered by these very specific alterations, and what are the genes that are uh, downstream of that. So we can now uh, share all of that information with the world for people to make insights on any genetic region that they care about. But we also want to utilize that information to gain insights into human disease. So I'm going to talk in the remainder of the talk about how we can actually utilize this information of mapping these non-coding elements and uncovering these circuits to actually uh, gain insights in the tissues and the regulators that control uh, human disease. And uh, that, that's the next session section. So this is joint work with uh, Luke Ward and uh, Jason Ernst, who's now a professor at uh, UCLA. So we're now going to utilize these epigenomic maps to predict what are the tissues in which these genetic variants are likely to act. So how do we do that? We basically start in every, for every trait in the GWAS catalog with all of the genetic variants that are associated with that trait. We basically look at um, every region of association, and within these regions of association at the specific SNPs that are uh, the most associated with the disease. So we can now do that not just for one trait, but for every trait. And we can basically get different genomic intervals associated with different traits in this particular cartoon. And on top of that, we can now overlay the epigenomic annotations. So, for example, all of these regions here are active in stem cells. 
And we can basically ask, well, what is the cell type that is the most enriched here? And you can see that they overlap over and over again genetic variants that are associated with height. So that allows us to now say, well, let's put a check mark here in terms of the you know, genetic variants associated with height are quite likely to act in stem cells. And we can do the same thing with immune cells and uh, you know, put a checkbox here for uh, specific immune disorders. We can do the same thing for um, you know, heart enhancers, the same thing for, for liver enhancers. And that actually gives us a picture of what are the cell types in which every genetic trait might act in a completely unbiased way. And what that leads to is this map here, which is actually real data, that uh, summarizes a lot of the information that I painted on the previous slide. So you can see here height is associated with embryonic stem cell activity. Uh, immune traits is associated with, are, are associated with uh, T cell and B cell activity. The genetic variants that are associated with blood pressure, for example, appear to act in, uh, you know, specifically one cell type, which is the left ventricle. And that makes a lot of sense. That's, that's where the blood pressure gets built up prior to being pumped in the rest of the body. If you look at the genetic variants associated with cholesterol, you can basically trace them to, you know, uh, liver uh, enhancers. And if you look here at the fasting glucose related traits, you can actually trace them to pancreatic islets, which again makes a lot of sense in terms of insulin secretion. If you look at inflammatory bowel disease, you see this very strong enrichment for immune uh, cell types, but also for all, all of these genetic uh, cell types. And then lastly, there are some surprises. If you look at Alzheimer's disease in the second to last line, and you trace it out, you don't actually see an enrichment in these brain tissues, you know, where one would have expected, but instead you see this very strong enrichment in monocytes. So these are CD14 plus cells. So we partnered up with our collaborator Li Hui Tsai over at the Picauer Institute and uh, her student Liz Grunesca and my uh, student Andreas Fenning. And what we basically f did is that we um, took this initial hint and then we carried out experiments both in mice and in humans to see uh, what is really this immune component of Alzheimer's disease. And what we found is that there are two types of changes that are happening during progression of Alzheimer's. There's certainly repression of these neuronal, uh, neuronal genes, uh, both at the RNA level, at the promoter level, and at the enhancer level. But you also see this activation of these immune uh, regions. And what's really interesting is that the repression actually happens later during the disease progression than the activation of the immune cells. So that actually suggests that perhaps the neuronal component is in fact downstream of the immune component. Or more bluntly, that this is not simply a case of neuronal degeneration leading to inflammation and turning on of these immune genes, but it might actually be the, way, the other way around. So the uh, prediction is that immune cell dysregulation is in fact a causal component of the disease because of the temporal differences between immune activation that happens earlier than neuronal repression, as well as because of the um, enrichment of these genetic variants that are associated with Alzheimer's disease, which happens specifically in the CD14 primary cells, which are markers of both microglial cells that are the resin immune cells of the adult brain, as well as macrophages that infiltrate the brain during neurodegeneration. So from this very simple view, we can already gain a lot of insight into the tissues and the regulators that underlie uh, specific disorders. But what's really interesting here is that we can actually utilize this epigenomic information to predict additional genetic regions that are associated with uh, uh, disease. So as I showed in my first slide, genetic variants associated with uh, human disease very often are very, very uh, significant. You know, they, they pass this genome-wide significance threshold of 5 times 10 to the minus 8. But there's a large number of genetic variants that are modestly associated with disease 
and do not reach genome-wide significance with current uh, cohort sizes. So we basically ask, can we actually characterize sub-threshold variants that are associated with a specific disorder using the information that we can learn from the genome-wide significant variants? And uh, we basically learned a large number of these uh, signatures, such as where are these regions active, where are they not active, you know, where are they differentially methylated, how are they conserved across different species, and so on and so forth, in order to develop a predictor that can now tell us, well, in this twilight zone of sub-threshold variants, which of those are actually more likely to be biologically meaningful? And we were able to actually experimentally validate a large number of those using luciferous assays as well as uh, chromatin interactions. And we were also able to validate them using human genetic evidence, which is much stronger for the sub-threshold variants that we're prioritizing, as well as mouse evidence by specifically disrupting these genes in mice, again leading to a contractility phenotype in this particular case, much more frequently for those genetic variants that we prioritize. And we even carried out specific disruptions using morpholino technology in zebrafish, and we found indeed a change in the repolarization duration for uh, those predicted target genes. So discovering these regions using only genomic association study would have actually required 60,000, uh, would have required 60, uh, 140,000 individuals, but we can actually do that with only a much smaller uh, number of individuals. We can also combine genetic and epigenetic information together. So up until now, I told you about how we can use epigenomic annotations in reference cell types, but we can actually see how this epigenetic information is actually changing across different individuals in the context of disease. So we can actually map multiple different uh, cell types and observe methylation changes, enhancer changes, and so on and so forth across each of these tissues to basically understand how are these leading to gene expression changes and ultimately intermediate phenotypes that lead to disease. And this is actually very hard because we actually have to account for potential feedback from the environment or the disease state itself. So in collaboration with Fielder Jaeger and David Bennett, we basically looked at methylation profiles across a large number of Alzheimer's patients and controls. And for each of them, we observed their genome, their epigenome using methylation profiling, as well as their phenotype using a rich set of phenotypes followed uh, over more than 10 years. And what we find is that a very large number of genetic variants influence the methylation profile across the genome. So 50,000 different regions are actually associated with genetic changes that lead to epigenetic differences between these individuals. And what's really interesting is that these changes actually focus on these enhancer regions, these distal regulatory regions. So they happen predominantly in these intermediate methylation regions, not at the most extremes of DNA methylation. And these intermediate regions are the most enriched in enhancers, which are by far the most uh, uh, intermediately methylated regions. We can also look at the overall variability across individuals. And what we find is that enhancers are by far the most variable and promoters are by far the least variable differing by an order of magnitude in their variability. And lastly, promoters are actually depleted in genotype-driven variation, whereas enhancers are actually enriched in this genotype-based uh, variation. And lastly, enhancers are actually the most predictive in their ability to classify whether an individual is uh, an Alzheimer's case or control in our data set whereas promoters are actually much less informative and genetic information alone is uh, much, much less informative. So that allows us to now predict genetic regions that are predictive of Alzheimer's disease. And these regions are indeed quite enriched in the genetic uh, variants that are associated with Alzheimer's disease. So if you rank all of the genetic, uh, all of the methylation probes based on their association with Alzheimer's, the strongest enrichment for genetic association with Alzheimer's 
is found at the very top of the rank list. And correcting for the effect of genetic variants on methylation actually reduces our ability to predict Alzheimer's disease, suggesting that in fact methylation is a causal component all the way to, on the way to disease. We can also do this in the context of multiple phenotypes, and what we're finding is that different genomic intervals are in fact associated with different subsets of Alzheimer's uh, phenotypes, and that these subsets are in fact playing very different roles in the biology of uh, Alzheimer's disease. So different subsets of functional pathways are associated with different uh, phenotypic signatures of Alzheimer's, and these actually manifest themselves in uh, specific cell types. So depending on the specific signature of Alzheimer's disease, between neuritic plaques, neurofibrillary tangles, cognitive decline, the genetic the, the methylation probes that are associated with differences in those in either promoters or enhancer regions are in fact active in very specific uh, cell types. Lastly, we can actually put all of that information together and discover and manipulate the specific mechanisms underlying human disease. So let's go through those six steps that I promised in my very first slide. So what we would like to know is starting from a genetic region that is associated with disease, which contains a large number of highly co-inherited genetic variants, can we actually identify what are the tissues and cell types in which it acts? What are the target genes that these uh, control? What are the causal nucleotides that are driving this association? Who are the upstream regulators that are binding to these nucleotides differentially between risk and non-risk individuals? And lastly, what are the cellular and the organismal phenotypes that result from these alterations? And we applied all this in the context of obesity in the strongest genetic region associated with obesity. And this is work that we did jointly with Melina Klausinger, uh, who is now a professor at uh, Harvard Medical School. So this was published recently in the New England Journal of Medicine uh, this uh, past August. So I don't need to convince you how important obesity is. It costs uh, more than $200 billion a year in the U.S. alone, and it affects 500 million people worldwide. The strongest genetic association of, uh, with obesity was discovered in this FTO region, more than seven years ago. And this region is quite uh, remarkable because the genetic variants span a total of 40,000 nucleotides, and there are 89 common variants that are quite strongly associated with the disease, making it very difficult to identify what the causal variant is. And there's been a large amount of previous work associated with this locus, but that has resulted in very conflicting genes, conflicting tissues, and the focus has actually been previously on brain and on appetite. Uh, but we basically said, let's take an unbiased view and see what we can learn about this region. So what we're finding is going through these six steps. Number one, we find that the strongest epigenetic signal is actually found in the cells that are not acting in the brain remarkably, but instead are deciding between this uh, developmental lineage of white adipocytes which uh, store lipids and have these you know very very big juicy you know energy store and these uh, brown adipocytes that are actually very rich in mitochondria and burn energy dissipate energy as heat and this intermediate cell type known as beige or bright adipocytes that are um, sharing a developmental fate with the white adipocyte lineage, but share a lot of their properties with the brown adipocytes. The second step that we wanted to go through is identify the target genes. And you can see here how this genetic locus is extremely localized right on top of this FTO gene. But in fact, it sits within a very large region of three-dimensional folding of the chromosome where a large number of other genes might actually be potential targets. And what we're finding is that only two of these genes 
actually show genetic differences between homozygous risk individuals and homozygous non-risk individuals for this FTO locus. And these two genes are IRX3 and IRX5 that are sitting 500,000 nucleotides and 1.2 million nucleotides away from this genetic region, suggesting that it acts at very, very large distances with a very strong genetic effect. The third step was to identify what is the causal variant. And here we actually use comparative genomics of a large number of species to identify modules of regulatory motifs that are highly conserved across the species, but disrupted in the individuals that carry the uh, specific uh, genetic mutation. And in this particular case, it predicted one of three possible regulators as the target of this disruption and a single nucleotide variant, RS142185, which changes a T in this AT-rich motif into a C, which abolishes the binding according to our models. Indeed, we found that if you go and perturb both the transacting regulator and the regulator motif in a conditional analysis between the cis and the trans, you find that you actually require the intact regulator and the intact motif in order to get successful repression, but disrupting either of them leads to derepression, both at the enhancer level as well as the uh, gene expression level for both IRX3 and IRX5. So what that tells us is that we now have a complete circuitry. We started with this region of association and we were able to narrow down the tissue, the target genes, the causal nucleotide, and the upstream regulator. But I still haven't told you about how this actually leads to obesity. And that's where we utilize these target genes, IRX3 and RX5, in order to gain more insights about how it actually functions. What we found is that genes with mitochondrial functions were negatively correlated with both IRX3 and IRX5, whereas genes involved in lipid metabolism were positively correlated with both genes. And indeed, this difference, which suggests a shift from energy dissipation to energy storage in the risk individuals, this difference was reflected at the cellular phenotypes of those individuals. The risk individuals had much lower DNA content for the mitochondria, suggesting much less mitochondrial biogenesis. And they also had much larger adipocytes, suggesting an accumulation of lipids. What we found, therefore, is that there's this... Hello? Hi, may I speak with Manolo? Uh, sorry, I'm in the middle of a webinar. I thought it was the webinar calling. I can't talk right now, sorry. Oh, okay, no. Uh, sorry, guys, I thought it was a call from the organizers. So I'm almost wrapped up here. So here we, here we have the model for the tissue autonomous role of adipocyte metabolism in uh, obesity. And the beauty of having the circuitry is that we can actually start manipulating it. We can actually reverse these effects and switch between lean and obese phenotypes by actually intervening at each one of these knobs, if you wish. So we can control the target genes, we can control the genetic variant itself, and we can control the upstream regulator. And in every one of these cases, we see that we can actually switch between lean and obese phenotypes exactly as you would predict based on knockdown or overexpression of either of these genes or based on editing of that single nucleotide. And now when we talk about precision medicine, imagine that out of the 3.2 billion nucleotides in the human genome, I could tell you that there's a single nucleotide whose editing from the C risk allele to the T protective allele would actually reverse the cellular signatures of obesity. And indeed, we went in and we edited, you know, this nucleotide from T to C and from C back to T, showing that we could actually lead to derepression of RX3 and RX5 and the repression again upon editing with uh, CRISPR-Cas9. We can also reverse the uh, loss of thermogenesis in the risk individuals. So you can see here that the, the risk individuals are unable 
to uh, turn on this process of heat dissipation upon stimulation. But as soon as you edit that single nucleotide, you actually see a sevenfold increase in the process of thermogenesis, both basal as well as stimulated, suggesting that we can in fact find the causal nucleotide at the cellular level. Altering the expression of either IRX3 or IRX5 in either risk or non-risk individuals can actually flip between the risk and the non-risk phenotypes, suggesting that again, these are the causal driver genes. And lastly, going into mice, we can actually repress this IRX3 gene. And what we find is that it actually leads to a 50% loss in body weight for these individuals, a 50% loss in fat mass ratio, a complete resistance to body weight gain in a high fat diet for these mice, and no change in appetite, no change in exercise, and uh, instead what you see is increased energy utilization when these mice are awake, but also when these mice are sleeping. So even in their sleep, these mice are actually burning more energy uh, through this process of thermogenesis. So we can now directly manipulate the disease signatures by understanding how these genetic variants are acting on the you know, specific nucleotide that they alter, on the target genes that they alter, and on the ultimately uh, cellular phenotypes that we can actually now start manipulating. And the FTO variant was number 14 in a very long list of dramatically significant uh, genome-wide uh, significant uh, non-coding variants. And we need now new technologies for going through those systematically. And we are uh, you know, engaged in several computational and experimental collaborations for systematically evaluating the effects of non-coding variants across a large number of different lineages and carrying out cellular assays in uh, high throughput ways in order to understand how we can actually dissect uh, these regions. So what I told you about is how we can, number one, utilize regulatory genomics and epigenomics to characterize the epigenomic landscape, map non-coding elements, uncover their circuitry, and link non-coding variants to their enhancers, their target genes, their regulators, and the cell types in which they act. Number two, how we can identify the disease-relevant tissues and regulators which gave us a lot of insights in Alzheimer's disease and which allowed us to discover new heart repolarization genes with cardiac functions below genome-wide significance. And we can actually combine genetic and epigenetic information together to discover the central role of enhancers and to identify loci that are um, important in Alzheimer's disease. We can now take these loci, understand their circuitry, and manipulate their circuitry systematically in order to understand disease mechanism. This has been an amazing collaboration with a large number of individuals for the Roadmap Epigenomics Project. The co-first authors were uh, Anshul Kondaji, Bader Milliman, and Jason Ernst. So the cardiac subthreshold loci, this collaboration with Xinxian Wang and Lori Boyer. Uh, for the Alzheimer's disease genetics and epigenetics, this is a collaboration with Phil Yeager and David Bennett. For Alzheimer's uh, disease in mouse, this is a collaboration with Lee Tai's lab. And for the mechanistic dissection of FTO, this is work that was initiated and led by Melina Klausnitzer for several years, and uh, I did not have too much time to talk about those. So I'll stop there, and I'll be very happy to take any questions. And uh, I see a few uh, of these questions already, but um, uh, I'm happy to open the floor. So I can read off uh, the questions. So uh, I see a question by Kevin uh, Davies, who's basically asking, how would you like to see epigenomic analysis incorporated into the Precision Medicine Initiative? This is a fantastic question. So the Precision Medicine Initiative, as you all know, seeks to establish a national cohort of a million individuals with very rich phenotypes that will now participate in a very open way, in a very collaborative way, in a systematic linking between genetic differences and uh, phenotype. Uh, I agree with Kevin that uh, mapping the molecular phenotypes of these individuals is extremely important, and that's something that can be done in a large number of blood cell types without uh, too much hassle by actually simply, you know, taking that blood sample uh, 
and separating it into a, lar a large number of different cell types, which will allow us to uncover a lot of the immune processes underlying disease. The moment you want to go to additional uh, cell types that are disease relevant, such as the brain, the liver, the heart, pancreatic islets, it becomes much more challenging to get volunteers to donate, uh, you know, pieces of their body effectively. Uh, but these can be overcome using reference cohorts. I did not have time to talk about that, but we're very involved in the Genome, Genotype Tissue Expression Project, or GTEx, which actually has mapped more than, a, or which is actually mapping more than a thousand individuals and more than 40 different tissues across these uh, individuals in some cases. And uh, this is post-mortem samples, so it poses certain challenges associated with that. But one of the things that we're doing there is in addition to RNA variation in gene expression patterns, we're looking at epigenetic differences between these individuals in order to build a reference map for how genetic differences map to epigenetic differences. And that's something that can be leveraged by this uh, national cohort. Uh, William uh, Procunier is asking, what effect will this approach have on pharmacogenomic diagnostic panel development? This is a great question. So, a lot of what I talked about is how differences uh, in our genome is in fact, are, are in fact leading to differences in our uh, predisposition to disease. But the same genetic variants or different genetic variants scattered across our genome are also leading to differences in how we respond to treatment. And in fact, there are dozens of drugs in the market right now that have genetic indications in them that allow individuals to decide on the dose of treatment or decide on whether to use a drug or not based on uh, their genetic makeup. And I think we're going to see a lot more of that. And uh, sometimes by actually mapping which genetic variants are leading to differences in the response to a particular drug, we can actually understand better how the drug itself is acting and maybe even get more insights into the pathways underlying specific disorders for which the standard of care was de developed a long time ago without much knowledge of the underlying molecular effects of these uh, particular interventions. And we can actually start systematically understanding those effects uh, right now. Anastasia Subornova is asking, do you know any example of the clinical trials using enhancer modifiers in human? If yes, was it successful? So in cancer, there's a lot of uh, interest in modifying the epigenome directly. So a lot of uh, histone uh, deacetylase inhibitors or HDAC inhibitors are in fact commonly utilized in the context of cancer as a way to alter the circuitry of these cancer cells, which are in fact dysregulating their own genome and epigenome in order to evade you know, the immune system, in order to evade apoptosis, in order to proliferate and uh, so on and so forth. So uh, epigenetic treatment is uh, very much at the forefront of cancer research right now in terms of being able to, number one, shock the system uh, in order to, uh, you know, perhaps, uh, perhaps reverse and undo some of the um, reprogramming that may have actually led to the cancer state you know, in the first place. Um, the much more subtle epigenomic reprogramming of specific uh, cancer types in order to uh, reverse in a much more precise way the effects of the disease is something that is uh, not currently um, uh, done, but it's something that should be very much in the, uh, in, uh, in the horizon. Um, how to use uh, the genomic information in possible synergistic action of investigating drugs. So this is going a step beyond pharmacogenomics to basically look at the uh, combination of multiple drugs together. And that's, again, uh, a natural extension, but something, something that has not yet been done. And uh, how are enhancers linked with uh, regulatory genes? I, I covered that at the beginning. Uh, part of the way that we uh, link enhancers to their target genes is through the um, uh, three-dimensional folding of the genome, through the genetic interactions between genetic variants of the enhancer and the expression of the genes they control, as well as through the coordinated activity of the enhancer regions uh, and uh, their target genes.
So uh, I don't see any more questions. Um, you know, feel free to type them up. But uh, it's been a real pleasure uh, seeing so many of you uh, attend, and um, I I'll wait another couple of minutes to see if there's any more questions. And if not, um, you know, I'll I'll turn it over to the chairs. Well, thank you for an excellent, excellent presentation. And thank you for um, taking all the questions. Those are really great. Uh, I just wanted to ask you once more if you have any final comments for the audience before we go. Happily. So, um, yeah, so I mean, I think uh, the, the comments to the audience is basically very much a call for action. So I think uh, there's a lot of interest out there from academia, from industry, from the government in genomics right now. I think we need a lot more uh, basic education in genomics. I think we need a lot more involvement. And I think the main thing that we, we need that can really reverse the course of genomics is uh, patient advocacy. It's basically for people to take a hold of their own genetic information and uh, to, to basically really reverse the tide in openness, in sharing of information. A lot of the uh, results that I mentioned, a lot of the successes that the field has had have relied upon a very broad sharing of uh, genetic, epigenetic, uh, and functional information. There's a lot of uh, projects that are mapping these reference data sets, but at the same time, combining all of these with genetic information is posing a lot of new challenges in terms of privacy, in terms of ethics, in terms of non-discrimination. And I think um, you know, what we need is really uh, the, the, the people, <laughs> the patients, the you know, advocacy groups to, to come together and to sort of help share information help disseminate information, help build these resources, and help put uh, all of this information to the hands of researchers uh, in industry, in academia, uh, in the government. So I very much see a convergence uh, of the three different branches here uh, coming together and sort of collaborating broadly. And I think, uh, you know, patients uh, are, are going to be at the center of, of all of this. So anyway, thank you so much, guys, for, for listening. There's an awesome presentation uh, by Nathan uh, in about eight minutes. So uh, stay tuned. Um, looking forward to it. Bye-bye. Uh, I see another Q&A lighting up. Let me see if there's one more question. One more question. All right, unfortunately, we're running out of time. So maybe uh, Dr. Kellis can respond to that last question individually. Um, just to wrap up, today's webcast will be available for on-demand viewing through August of 2016. You will receive an email from us alerting you when it's available on demand and posted on labroots.com. Please feel free to forward this to any of your colleagues who weren't able to join in today. And thank you again for logging in and participating in today's webcast. We hope to see you again soon. Bye-bye.